The last few years for Washington football have been a complete roller coaster. Near the mid 2010s, Chris Peterson led the Huskies all the way to the college football playoff, and while they obviously didn't win a national championship, that was a huge step for a program like Washington. After that, Peterson continued his success before he eventually retired, and then came in Jimmy Lake. In the very little amount of time that Lake spent as the head coach at Washington, he ran the program into the ground, got into some trouble, and put Washington back seemingly a few years. Luckily though, Washington completely struck gold. They hired one of the most underrated coaches in all of college football, and his name is Kalen DeBoer. He helped fix the Indiana offense and continued the success at Fresno State, which led to him being hired at Washington. The first thing he did when he got there was rejuvenate the program, bring in some important transfers, and reunite with his former quarterback at Indiana, Michael Penix Jr. Combining that with some solid returning players, Washington was a sleeping giant going into the 2022 season. Except most people couldn't see that. In year one, DeBoer had a 10-win season, Michael Penix became one of the top quarterbacks in the country, they had an extremely explosive offense, and the Huskies almost won the conference. Now as we're over halfway to the 2023 season, Penix is the front runner for the Heisman Trophy, the Huskies are currently undefeated, and a college football playoff berth could easily happen. In today's video, I want to talk about how all this happened. We're going to go through the Chris Peterson days, talk about the disaster of Jimmy Lake, how Kalen DeBoer fixed everything, the key players that have helped Washington succeed, and what the future will look like for the Huskies. But before we get started, quickly be sure to leave a like if you want to support today's video, subscribe if you're new and love college football content, and let me know what player, team, topic, or situation I could cover next. And now let's get started and talk about the impossible rise of Washington football. Overall, Washington is a pretty historic program. They've won 17 conference championships, 7 Rose Bowls, have claimed 2 national championships, and have made the college football playoff. Their best team ever was in 1991, when they finished number one in the coaches poll, and I believe beat three top 10 teams. All time, Washington ranks 20th by win percentage and 19th by total victories, so they have cemented themselves as a second tier college football program, which is pretty dang good. Sadly, it hasn't always been sunshine and rainbows for Washington since the turn of the century. In 2005, Tyron Willingham was named the head coach, and he did nothing but lose there. That might even be an understatement. He went 2-9 and nine in year 1, 5-7 and seven in year 2, 4-9 and nine in year 3, and 0-12 oh and in year 4. I have no idea how he got a fourth year, but he has got to be one of the worst head coaches in Power 5 football history. From there, Washington would really need to hire the right guy to get them back. Who did they get? Well, they got Steve Sarkeesian. You're probably more than familiar with that name, but he got his first big break in coaching at Washington. After going 5-7 and seven in year 1, he led the Huskies to four straight bowl games. They even won two of them, went 7-6 and six three times, and eventually in 2013, they went 9-4 and four and got back into the polls for the first time since 2001. During that time, they had a couple of really good players, including Jake Locker and Bishop Sankey. From there, we get into a really exciting era of Washington football, led by head coach Chris Peterson. After dazzling with Boise State, Peterson decided to go up to Washington, where he'd have more resources and a chance to compete for national championships. That is exactly what he would eventually do, and Peterson found success pretty much right away with Washington. In 2014, the team would go 8-6, with an eventual loss in the Cactus Bowl. 2015, though, would be the year where they were truly starting to build something special. The team went 7-6, but most importantly, developed a ton of star players that would help them get to the college football playoff in 2016. This roster included their superstar quarterback, Jake Browning, future NFL back Miles Gaskin, and future NFL receivers in John Ross, Dante Pettis, Drew Sample, and Will Disley. Combine that with an incredible defense that included Buda Baker and Vita Vea, and you had yourself a recipe for success in 2016. As I said, the Huskies ended up climbing as high as number four in the country, and they were selected to play Alabama in the first round of the college football playoff. While they ultimately got dismantled, Getting there was a huge step in the right direction, and exactly what Chris Peterson envisioned at Washington. Unfortunately, over the next two or three years, they get close, but were not able to replicate that same success. In 2017, the team went 10-3, in 2018, they went 10-4, and, and also went 7-2 and two in the conference both of those years. Eventually, both Miles Gaskin and Jake Browning had to leave school, so in Chris Peterson's final year, he ended up going 8-5, and five with Georgia transfer Jacob Eason, future NFL back Salvin Ahmed, and big time NFL tight end Hunter Bryant. Fun fact, Puka Nakua is also on that team. After a nice career with Washington, Chris Peterson decided he was gonna hang up the clipboard and retire from coaching altogether. His six years there were extremely successful as he won over eight games in five of those six years, won over 10 games three times, got to one Rose Bowl, and obviously got to the college football playoff. He did a great job, and now it was time to hand the keys over to one of his successors, Jimmy Lake. So pretty much all along, Jimmy Lake was always going to take over for Washington. He was with Chris Peterson at Boise State, 
and then eventually came with him to Washington. He gradually went up the ladder, starting as a defensive backs coach, and eventually becoming the defensive coordinator from 2018 to 2019. He was also one of the top recruiters in the country, and eventually was named the head coach going into the 2020 season. He would inherit a pretty decent roster, and Washington had a lot of expectations for 2020. Many expected it to be a smooth transition, but unfortunately, Washington football really fell off during the Jimmy Lake era. So going into the 2020 season, the world was completely flipped upside down, and the Pac-12 was delayed. At the time, Dylan Morris was the quarterback, and they really didn't have much going on at either the running back or receiver spot. It was a very forgettable year, as they ended up beating Oregon State, Arizona, and Utah before losing at home to Stanford. The team went 3-1 and one and weren't able to play the rest of the year due to an outbreak within the team. Technically, Jimmy Lake won the Pac-12 North in year one, but everyone knew his first real season would come in 2021. Going into the 2021 season, Dylan Morris was once again back at quarterback, and things got off to an awful start. After being ranked number 20 in the preseason polls, Washington lost at home 13-7 to Montana, and then proceeded to get embarrassed on the road against Michigan 31-10. The 0-2 start was absolutely horrible, and wins over Arkansas State and Cal really didn't do much to calm the flame. From there, they lost on the road to Oregon State by 3, and then lost by 7 at home to UCLA. Lake was now 2-4 and four on the season, and luckily got two straight wins over bad opponents to get back to 500. They beat both Stanford and Arizona before the Oregon game. This is when Jimmy Lake was pretty much done. After a couple of questionable play calls, Lake was seen striking one of his players, and in a press conference when he was asked why he did so, he said that he didn't end up hitting the player at all. Well, unfortunately for him, we live in the 21st century, so it was very easy to prove whether he was lying or not, and it clearly showed him hitting a player, and eventually he was suspended. He'd be suspended for the Arizona State game, and not long after, he was fired. Not only was Lake not a good leader, he was losing big time recruits in the area, and was apparently super stubborn and disorganized, and one person in an athletic article was that he thought Washington was a casino where he was guaranteed to win. His tenure lasted all of 13 games, the cupboard of players was bare, and Washington would need to nail their next hire. Who would they go out and get? Well, they got a guy by the name of Kalen DeBoer. But who is he? Kalen DeBoer has one of the most fascinating backstories of any coach in college football, as he is still very young for his position. He ended up growing up in Millbank, South Dakota, and eventually went to Sioux Falls. He played wide receiver there and got his coaching start in 1997. He worked his way up from an assistant in 1998 to becoming the head coach in 2005. He obviously saw enough success that he was eventually poached by an FCS school. He became the offensive coordinator for Southern Illinois, and then eventually made the jump to Eastern Michigan. In 2017, he became the offensive coordinator for Fresno State, developed a great relationship with that community, and then took his first Power 5 job. In 2019, he became the offensive coordinator for the Indiana Hoosiers. Indiana is one of the worst Power 5 programs and really tough to see success at. Luckily, he had a quarterback by the name of Michael Penix Jr. and a couple of star players that allowed his offense to thrive and it looked good on his resume. When Fresno State needed a new head coach in 2020, they reached back out to DeBoer and took a chance on him. In his first year, the team went 3-3, three and three, but for a first-year coach in 2020, that really didn't mean much. He basically got a free pass for that season, so his real abilities were going to show in 2021. Luckily, he had a superstar quarterback in Jake Hayner, and Fresno State did terrific. They ended up going 9-3, and, and they almost beat Oregon. They only lost that game 31-24, and Fresno State was one of the better group of five teams in the country. The Bulldogs had a terrific offense, and Kalen DeBoer was quickly rising up the coaching ranks. But was he good enough to be poached by a bigger school? No one really knew, but Washington decided they were going to take a chance on him. At the time, the hire got mixed reviews. For anyone who knew Kalen DeBoer, they knew this was a great hire, but to an outsider, he was just another average coach at an average group of five program, and by no means did anyone think that they could have playoff hype in year one. When he was hired, he said, quote, my family and I are so grateful for the opportunity to lead such a storied program and be a part of this prestigious institution. The tough, hard-nosed tradition of Washington football speaks for itself, and it was obvious throughout this process that UW is committed to competing at the highest level. To most, that sounds like average coach speech in a press conference, but for once, a coach actually lived up to the hype and did exactly what he said he was going to do. Washington has become a tough football team and has already brought them back to their storied tradition. How did he do this? What well, first started in the transfer portal? Because the Huskies already had some solid defensive players and a group of high potential receivers, he immediately went to work and went out and got a good running back and a good quarterback. He got Wayne Talapapa from Virginia, who had become a key part of their 2021 team, and went out and got Michael Penix Jr. from Indiana. For a little backstory on him, he is one of the craziest stories in all college football. At one time, he was just a three-star recruit coming out of the state of Florida, 
and was committed to play football at Tennessee for Butch Jones. Interestingly enough, he was supposed to come in alongside Adrian Martinez, but Jeremy Pruitt would pull both their offers. This would lead Penix to making a new decision, and eventually chose to go to Indiana, where he was offered the opportunity to play. He played in one game his freshman year against Penn State, got hurt, and then eventually took over in 2019, but got hurt again. He was seen as a guy with unlimited potential, but he just literally could not stay healthy. In 2020, he led Indiana to a historic start, had that crazy conversion against Penn State, and at times had Indiana in the mix for a playoff spot. Unfortunately though, he got hurt again. Going into 2021, he was apparently not healthy, looked absolutely horrible the whole year, Indiana was awful, and everyone forgot about him. Everyone except Kalen DeBoer. He was willing to give Penix one last chance, because if he could stay healthy, he had a potential of being a top three quarterback in all of college football. That is exactly what would happen. In order for Penix to succeed though, he would have to have guys to throw the ball to. Luckily, Washington had some studs from their 2020 class. First, you had Roma Dunze. Coming out of Bishop Gorman High School, he was the National Gatorade Player of the Year in 2019. In his career, he had 121 catches for nearly 3,000 yards and 31 touchdowns. He was a big-time four-star recruit who could have gone anywhere in the country, but chose to go to Washington. After showing immense potential his first two years on campus, he would break out in 2022. It's pretty much the same exact story for Jalen McMillan. He was also a huge recruit, as in his career, he had 260 catches for 5,234 yards and 54 touchdowns. He came out of the state of California and was ranked as high as the number eight wide receiver in the entire country. He chose to go to Washington as well, and after showing some potential in 2020 and 2021, eventually blew up in 2022 as well. The third man in the group was Jalen Polk, who started his career at Texas Tech and then came to Washington. Then as I said earlier, they got running back Wayne Talapapa from Virginia, and those four guys, combined with Coach DeBoer, would create one of the most explosive and dynamic offenses in all of college football last year. So, with Washington having pretty much no expectations for the 2022 season, how did they end up doing? So going into the season, there was a quarterback battle for a little while, as you had the incumbent starter in Dylan Morris, the highest rated quarterback in school history, Sam Heward, and then obviously Michael Penix Jr. Boer gave Penix his first chance, and once he got back on the field, he showed how much potential he had. He ended up putting up nearly 400 yards against Kent State, and then helped them destroy Portland State in week two. All those offensive players looked great, but this came against nobodies. Week three, Washington would be unranked for their game against Michigan State, and the number 11 Spartans were fresh off a breakout 2021 campaign. In this primetime matchup, Michael Penix put on an absolute show, throwing dart after dart, and got out to a blowout lead over the Spartans. Eventually, Peyton Thorne did lead them back, but Washington won 39-28, showing they had the chance to be one of the Cinderella teams of the 2022 season, and that their offense was going to be tough to stop. From there, the Huskies would jump to number 18 in the polls and would take care of Stanford. They got out to 4-0 before they would be hit with two straight road games. The first was against UCLA, the second was against Arizona State. The UCLA was led by their fifth-year quarterback, Dorian Thompson-Robinson, and this was supposed to be their breakout year under Chip Kelly. They were expected to lose that game, and that is what happened. They lost 40-32, but they were not supposed to lose on the road to Arizona State. This was a Sun Devils team that was super banged up and not any good at all, so that second straight loss had many people wondering if Washington's first few games were just a fluke and that they would fall apart. Nope, once they got punched in the mouth, DeBoer did exactly what his press conference said. They'd play tough. They ended up beating Arizona 49-39, then went on the road and took care of Cal 28-21. Not the most dominating victories, but two hard-fought wins. After that, they played a super tough Oregon State team at home, and the Beavers were ranked number 23 for this one. It ended up being a thriller, and Washington ended up winning 24-21. They got back into the polls at number 25, and now had their toughest game of the year on the road against number 6 Oregon. In a duel with Bo Nix, Michael Penix put on a show, and in one of the games of the year, Washington went into Eugene and stunned the Ducks, and they won 37-34. Now Washington was legit, and no one could say they were fake. From there, they destroyed Colorado 54-7 before they'd play their final game of the year in the Apple Cup and take down Cam Ward's Washington State 51-33. After those two tough losses in the middle of the season, Washington truly bounced back and went 10-2 in the regular season. Unfortunately, they were not able to make the Pac-12 championship game, but they would be matched up in the Alamo Bowl against number 20 Texas. In this game, it was once again a thriller, and they won 27-20. In Kalen DeBoer's first year, the Huskies ended up going 11-2, won a big-time bowl game, and proved to the world that they were here to stay. Michael Penix at times had legit Heisman hype, as he threw for 4,641 yards with 31 touchdowns and 8 picks. He probably could have gone off to the NFL, but he wanted to do more, was probably going to make a ton of money in NIL, and had unfinished business, so he decided to come back. This would secure a lot of hype for them going into 2022. 
Wayne Tomapapa and Cam Davis combined for 24 touchdowns, which helped to balance out the offense, and both those guys were ridiculously important. At the receiver spot, as I said, they had a three-headed monster in Roma Dunze, Jalen McMillan, and Jalen Polk. Adunze and McMillan combined for over 150 catches for 2,200 yards and 16 touchdowns, and Polk was also great. Their offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, was being listed for potential head coaching vacancies, and with Washington returning some of their key defensive players, all those receivers, and their superstar quarterback, the hype for them going into 2023 was going to be absolutely ridiculous. At the time, I was somewhat worried about Michael Penix coming back because of his injury history and how he could have thrown away his whole NFL future. But so far through this season, Penix has proved to be just as good, he stayed healthy, and now he could legitimately win the Heisman and get Washington to a college football playoff berth. Going into 2023, as I said, they returned most of their defense, their star quarterback, their star receivers, and most of their coaching staff. Pretty much everything was in a good spot, except now the board have to build depth find a new running back, and find a quarterback to replace Penix in the future. In terms of his recruiting class, it was ranked number 26 in the country, which infused the program with a lot of talent for the future, and he went out and got a couple of big upgrades. At running back, he brought in a four-star transfer by the name of Dylan Johnson from Mississippi State, former blue chip running back from Arizona State, Daniel Ngata, and also got a four-star wide receiver transfer named Jeremy Bernard from Michigan State. There were obviously a couple of other options as well, but with Sam Heward transferring to the FCS level, it was now time to find a new quarterback. Originally, DeBoer had a commitment from a little-known three-star quarterback by the name of Lincoln Keenholz. He was a kid from South Dakota, but as he got better and better, he eventually became a four-star recruit, one of the top gunslingers in the class of 2023, and flipped to Ohio State. Their consolation prize, though, was Austin Mack, who was the number eight quarterback in the country according to 24-7 Sports, and a top 100 player. So really, everything was looking good. Michael Penix would need to stay healthy, the receivers would need to make big plays, and someone would have to step up at running back, and Washington was going to get a chance to do something special. Their Pac-12 schedule is going to be ridiculously difficult, but so far, they've managed to do a tremendous job. In week one, they played against Boise State, and while some thought Taylor Green and the Broncos could put up a fight, it was over pretty quickly, and the number 10 Huskies beat the Broncos 56-19. In week two, they played Tulsa at home, and despite the Golden Hurricane having an air raid offense, Washington's defense shut him down, and the offense put up 43 points and another dominating victory. In week three, they'd travel on the road to Michigan State. Some thought this would be a trap game, including myself, but pretty quickly we found out how dysfunctional Michigan State was this year, and there was going to be no revenge game. Michael Penix put up historic numbers in the first half, and they won 41-7, absolutely curb-stomping the Spartans and sending them down a tunnel of misery. After that, they'd come back home and destroy Cal before they'd have a scare. Coach Jed Fish has slowly been building Arizona over the last few years, and the Wildcats gave them all they could handle, as Washington barely survived the upset vid and won 31-24. They're now 5-0 and ranked number 7 in the country for what many thought was the game of the year so far against number 8, Oregon. In a second duel against Bo Nix, Penix now had the advantage of the home crowd behind him, and this game was awesome. There was a brief stretch where it looked like Oregon could run out the clock, but after Dan Lanning went for an fourth down, Washington got the ball back and within two plays scored a touchdown. Oregon was down three, Bo Nix drove them down the field, and eventually they missed a game-winning field goal, and Washington survived 36-33, beating Oregon for the second year in a row and climbing up to number five. Since then, though, they've had a little bit of a hangover as they struggled to get going against Arizona State. They won 15-7, and many say that the officials really saved the day for Washington. This past weekend, they didn't really do that much better as they only beat Stanford 42-33, and for some reason, the last two weeks, things have been a little bit off. Maybe it's because they're playing the bottom-level competition in the Pac-12, or maybe it's because they've been thinking ahead to the USC game. Originally, this was supposed to be the game of the year in the Pac-12, but unfortunately, Caleb Williams has really fallen off, and USC has two losses, and their defense is horrible, so this game's now fallen apart a little bit, but it's still going to be a difficult test. The Trojans are ranked number 20 in the country, have all the offensive potential in the world, and are at home for this game against Washington. It's going to be the nationally broadcasted game, and I am concerned that Washington could drop this game. Ultimately, I'm going to say they win close because of how bad USC's defense is, but from there, they're going to have to survive three more games if they want to get to the Pac-12 championship. They're going to have to beat a tough Utah team at home, travel to a really tough Oregon State team on the road, and then take care of Washington State at home in the Apple Cup. The Cougars started out strong, but have looked a lot worse since then. If they do, they'll get back to the Pac-12 championship, where they'll likely rematch with Oregon. It's hard to beat a team like that twice in one season, so Washington still has four really tough games on their schedule before they could even think about getting to the college football playoff. Luckily though, if they have one loss, they could still get in, but Kalen DeBoer has done a tremendous job. The Huskies are currently ranked number five in the country. Many believe that Michael Penix is the frontrunner for the Heisman Trophy, and they are truly seeing unbelievable success. 
I'd argue that this team is better than the Jake Browning and Miles Gaskin team back in 2016, and they're just so much fun to watch. I don't think Kalen DeBoer is going to be the best recruiter ever, but he's going to get the right guys for his system, and really there are only two big questions when it comes to this guy. One, will DeBoer actually stay at Washington if offered a bigger job? And two, how will he handle the next quarterback? Finding a truly elite quarterback is tough in college football, and DeBoer lucked out with Penix. Will he be able to do that again, or will he struggle from there? After Jake Browning left, the Huskies really couldn't find that guy, and it bit them. DeBoer not only has to do that, but he's got to live up to the high bar he's already set for himself and could be tempted to take a bigger job. For example, if something like the Clemson, Alabama, or Michigan job opens up and that was offered to DeBoer, would he take it? I don't know, but right now he's definitely one of the most qualified coaches to take that next leap. Either way, DeBoer has rebuilt Washington football, Michael Penix is awesome, and the Huskies are fun to watch. But what do you guys think? If you're a Washington fan, what did I get right and wrong? What do you think of this team, and what has made them so successful? Be sure to let me know down below. Let me know what team I should cover in my next video. Subscribe if you're new, and check out all my other videos on the end screen. Hope to see you guys again soon, and until next time.